Welcome everybody to the webinar by Professor Daron Acemoğlu with the title Remaking the Post-COVID World Lessons from the Narrow Corridor. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Acemoğlu. And it's an honor because he is one of the very few social scientists who address truly big questions in a truly interdisciplinary manner. And I am also honored to have with him today because we both graduated from a Turkish institution some years ago. That's an extra honor for me. And he's a well, very well-known scholar, but let me just briefly summarize some aspects of his bio. Professor Daron Acemoğlu is an institute professor at MIT and the co-author of many books and author of many books as well, including Why Nations Fail, Power, Prosperity, and Poverty. And his recent book, The Narrow Corridor, States, Societies, and the Fate of Liberty, will be the basis of his presentation today. His academic work covers a wide range of areas, including political economy, economic development, economic growth, inequality, labor economics, and economics of networks. Ajem Olu is an elected fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, Turkish Academy of Sciences, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Econometric Society, and half a dozen other societies. Many prizes he received include the Schultz Prize, Rosen Award, Newman Award, Carnegie Fellowship, and again, a long list of awards. Today, he is going to talk about his new co-author book, as well as the post-COVID, remaking the world conditions in post-COVID era. Audience will, be, will have the opportunity to ask questions so that please use the Q&A option in your Zoom tools instead of chat. And the Professor Ajemola will present his talk then there will be about 45 minutes for q and I will moderate. Without further ado, Professor Ajemoğlu. Thank you, Ahmed. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And uh, as Ahmed said, I'm going to talk about uh, the current problems facing us and what the way forward may be. But I'm going to offer a perspective on these questions based on the book that I co-authored with Jim Robinson, The Narrow Corridor. Uh, the book was written in 2017 and 2018 for the most part, so well before the COVID crisis, but many of the other fault lines of the current Western democracies and the emerging world were already visible to us. So there were some perspectives in the book, but I'm going to try to provide some of the ideas of the book as well as expand on these perspectives. I'm an economist, but also a scholar of political economy and political power. And this book is in some sense about something a little broader than economic and political development. And we give it the name of liberty, although unfortunately liberty is used in many different ways and sometimes politicized. But what we mean by liberty is actually what the philosopher Philip Pettit defines or is related. It's the opposite of what Philip Pettit defines as dominance. An individual is dominated when she lives at the mercy of another, having to live in a manner that leaves you vulnerable to some ill that the other is in a position to arbitrarily impose, subject to arbitrary sway, being subject to the potentially capricious will or the potentially idiosyncratic judgment of another. We define, Jim and I define liberty as lack of dominance, freedom from threat of violence and threat of undue power. And the question that I wanna frame the current discussion around is whether the future of liberty is bright or bleak for democracy, for economic equality, which I'm going to argue is also an integral part of liberty thus conceived. Many scholars have made predictions over the last several decades on this. Francis Fukuyama very famously and maligned, for example, predicted the end of history in 1989 with an unabashed victory of political and economic liberalism, as he called it. Well, 
right after he wrote, the reverberations of the fall of the Berlin Wall were still being felt, and the 1990s were indeed a decade of a rapid expansion of democracy. But since then, things haven't looked very good for democracy, especially in the emerging world. So this is data from the Freedom House, which shows that well before the COVID crisis started, democracies were in decline. And every year since 2006, there have been more countries that have taken steps away from democracy, sometimes quite radically, uh, as many and then, then countries that have taken the, their institutions towards more democratic ones. So the end of history thesis in one form or another is still with us, but it's certainly taken some hits. A few years after Fukuyama, another scholar, Robert Kaplan, predicted something quite different. He entitled it The Coming of Anarchy, and he predicted that violence is going to become more and more under control and it's going to spread throughout the world. He viewed it uh, as a modern version of Thomas Hobbes's dystopia, where lives are poor, nasty, brutish, and short, and every man fights against every man without a powerful state that acts as a guarantor of rules, order, and protects individuals. Actually, it looks a little bit closer to what has happened, especially in the Middle East, for those of you who care about the Middle East. You know, as, uh, uh, as the Islamic State spread for essentially uncontrolled for about three years, it brought complete chaos and destruction to places like Raqqa, Syria, or Mosul, Iraq, and this, quite tellingly, was preceded by exactly a failure that Thomas Hobbes would have recognized as he was himself inspired by the English Civil War in the middle of the 17th century. And in fact, what preceded the destruction and carnage that the Islamic State caused, for example, in the Middle East, was the complete collapse of the state in Iraq and to some degree in Syria. These are the helmets that Iraqi soldiers left behind as they were fleeing uh, Islamic State, a symbol of, uh, of, 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 of the collapse of state institutions. But perhaps many of you will instinctively be drawn more to a different vision or a different danger in the future, which you might call the revenge of the state, uh, many people have pointed this out, but Yuval Noah Harari, uh, the Israeli scholar, uh, historian, uh, has dubbed it the digital dictatorship. That AI tools will increasingly empower the state, although I would also add to Harari's list of empowered agents, the corporations, which have greater and greater control and behavioral manipulation powers over individuals. Freedom, democracy, political participation may become much weakened exactly like many scholars are now fearing. And the coronavirus crisis may have actually accelerated that trend because for very understandable reasons, we had to empower the state to play much greater roles and penetrate our lives much more finally. But I will argue in line with the thesis of the book that there is a sense in which all three of these have an element of the sort of the deterministic predictions about the future in the spirit of what was perhaps one of Marx's most famous utterances, which is that the hen mill gives you society with the feudal lord, the steam mill society with the industrial capitalist. Somehow technology shapes our future. Either it leads to collapse or it leads to a digital dictatorship. And there are very few things we can do about it. I will argue the opposite. I will argue, and that again is in line with the main thesis of the narrow corridor, that technologies have very little determining power. They're just tools. And the question is how we use these tools. And that is also relevant when you think about the new challenges, such as the coronavirus, which is certainly going to complicate things for democracy, it has already done so, for liberty, for globalization, or for the things that Harari was worried about. This is technological, definitely, when you have facial recognition cameras in places where 
uh, the, that form the public space for discourse, protest, democratic participation, that really changes things. Or the social credit system, which has now accelerated in various forms because of the coronavirus crisis and the greater need for data uh, uh, bookkeeping and data uh, collection by the government because of the uh, uh, testing and tracing in response to the virus. But these are also, I will argue, related, intimately related to economic changes that have been affecting much of the world, and especially the US, but also many developing nations. One aspect, not the only and not the only relevant, but one aspect of this is a huge increase in inequality, which I am here showing with what has happened with the real wages, inflation adjusted wages of men in the United States, divided into five groups. And you can see that in the 1960s, early 1970s were periods of the rising tide lifting all boats, inequality was stable. In fact, all five education groups from uh, high school dropout to workers with postgraduate degrees grew more or less at the same rate, about 2% a year in inflation adjusted terms. But then, since then, starting in the 1980s, something very different has happened. We see this curve fanning out, corresponding to a very, very large increase in inequality. But also you see what's going on with the red curve or the orange curve. Low education groups, even workers with some college, have seen their earnings fall quite significantly. So if you are a high school dropout man today, you are almost certainly earning less than your father. That, of course, has had various far-reaching social implications, not least the greater discontent that this has generated and the political upheavals that it has bred in the United States. And this has been associated not just with earnings, but with the nature of work, something I'm going to come back to at the end. It has gone hand in hand with the disappearance of the middle class, especially occupations, which are shown in orange or yellow in the middle, which are the bedrock of middle class existence in the United States, especially for workers without college, where they could essentially be upwardly socially mobile thanks to jobs in production, clerical, administrative, and sales occupation. Well, those have largely disappeared starting in the 1980s and accelerating later on. Many fewer of these jobs and many more of the jobs that are much lower pay, much lower career building, much less stable, such as in cleaning, security, operation, or health. This is not a US phenomenon. As I have indicated, it's true. And the same picture as the previous one holds in throughout the developed world. In all of the developed world, the middle class occupations have disappeared, even though the inequality implications have been a little bit more variegated. This figure documents that by showing how the middle paying third of occupations have fared since the early 1990s to the before, just before the Great Recession in various countries and without fail, all of them have had those middle class occupations contract significantly. So with all of these challenges, which is it to be for our future? Perhaps a digital dictatorship as we become more and more dissatisfied and turn to a powerful state to save us or destroy us. Or state institutions become less and less capable of containing discontent and the things that have transpired in the Middle East or parts of Africa or Asia now start spreading to the West and to the rest of the emerging world. Or perhaps Fukuyama and somehow the march of democracy will somehow come back. Well, perhaps we need a framework to think about these things, especially about how technology and the changes in our environment will affect the power of the state, inequality, liberty. And we want to think about that from history, but with some evidence and with some new ideas as well. Well, I'm going to offer such a framework. But before I do that, let me go back to the first known text uh, about state governance and such issues. I'll argue 
as we do in the book with Jim, that actually the Sumerian tablets from 4,000 to 2,000 years ago, which have the Epic of Gilgamesh, actually were quite prescient in terms of their recognition of exactly the problems that we're tackling. But in some sense, they got the problem right, but not the solution. And getting the problem right is important, but we have to also think about the solution. So let's go back to the Gilgamesh epic. Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, <clears throat> is celebrated at the beginning of the epic as a hero, the man who created a rich, secure, and powerful city on the bank of the Euphrates. It tells how the city gleams like copper in the sun, wonderful temples, staircases, brickworks, all the infrastructure, and it's actually quite rich with uh, masterfully built public squares and houses. But there's a fly in the ointment right in the epic. It's the hitch of despotism. Once Gilgamesh is so powerful, what is there to restrain him? And the Gilgamesh epic tells of what other king has inspired such awe and describes Gilgamesh trampling its citizens like a wild bull. He is king, he does whatever he wants, takes the son from his father, crushes him, takes the girl from her mother and uses her. No one dares to oppose him. Well, that's a problem. But the epic doesn't stop there. It comes up with a solution. Citizens, sick of Gilgamesh's despotism and their lack of liberty, the dominance is palpable, cry to the god of the sky, to Anu, to stop this despotism. And Anu comes up with a solution. It's the precursor to the checks and balances solution or the doppelganger solution. According to the epic, Anu creates a double of Gilgamesh, a man equal to his strength and courage, a man with the stormy heart. This man, Enkidu, comes and fights Gilgamesh. Well, you know, it's unclear what happens. Gilgamesh may have beaten Enkidu, but Gilgamesh is at first under control because the checks and balances works. Even though the epic doesn't dwell on it, its limitations is actually clear from the tablets. Later on, the epic goes on to explain how Enkidu and Gilgamesh gang together and start working together. And if Enkidu is so strong, who will control him? And what about that fighting between Enkidu and Gilgamesh? That's not good, all, all those palace coups. Well, so the doppelganger solution, I will argue, or, or Jim and I argue, is not the right way to think about it. If you want liberty, sure, checks and balances is not a terrible idea, but it rarely works. You want something else. And what you want is what we call shackling the Leviathan. And that shackling doesn't come from a constitution or checks and balances. It doesn't come from some learned law that some lawgiver gives us. It comes from the citizen society itself, something that, of course, Sumerian tablets couldn't have known given how weak society was at the time. This we call the shackled Leviathan and explain in the book how it contains despotism, though in a very contingent way, not easy, but how it also paves the way to liberty and lack of dominance. But also once the Leviathan is shackled, its relationship to citizens changes, dynamics change, social change takes a very different nature. Since time is short, let me get cut to the chase and give you the main outlines of the framework of the book. It is summarized in this figure. It's simplified, albeit it gives a representation of the main ideas we want to document or we want to communicate. On the vertical axis, we have the power of the state. This is the despotic power of the state, what Gilgamesh was able to do the power of the state to provide public services, and also the power of the elite to determine what to do with that power, with that capability. On the horizontal axis, we have power of society, when citizens democratically participate and keep citizens accountable, or when you have the right norms or the collective action or the protest, or you have civil wars with uh, <clears throat> non-elites overruling elites, those are coming from the power of society. Now, if you think about this, most societies, throughout history were in this quadrant here. States were weak. Our ancestors were organized in what anthropologists call small-scale societies. 
with very limited political hierarchy. And we know how these uh, societies are organized, and I'll talk about one of them in a second to illustrate some of these ideas and their contrast to some others in the context of the TIV from southern Nigeria. But to us, the despotic Leviathan, this other quadrant is even more familiar. Those are the states we have grown up with, and those are the states that have written all of the written history throughout the ages. Today, you might think of China, both before communism, during its imperial period, and under communism today as an example of a despotic Leviathan. Very strong state and relatively weak society that cannot vote, that cannot organize, that cannot dis, uh, voice its discontent. It's strongly monitored. Society is subservient to the state. And you see the, the dynamics here that are represented by these arrows. Once society is strong, the state doesn't take off. Political hierarchy remains limited. I'll talk about why that is in a second. But once there is despotism, like under Gilgamesh, unless you can cry out to Anu as the Sumerians did, well, it's very hard to reverse that and the state actually tames society. Yet our framework emphasizes something very different happens when there is a balance between the power of the state and society. That's what happens inside this area, which looks to us like a corridor that gives the name to the book because it's a narrow corridor. It's narrow. It's not easy to be in it. It's not easy to stay in it when you are you find yourself in there. But there are some interesting ideas here as well. First, and I'll come back to that, we document and argue in the book that this is where liberty truly emerges and evolves. And obviously this is where democracy functions. Hobbes thought that liberty could emerge under a despotic leviathan, but not so. But even more interestingly, look at dynamics here, very different. The arrows here go in the direction of strengthening of one side and weakening of the other, whereas the arrows inside the corridor are heading to northeast, both state and society are simultaneously becoming stronger. Why is that? That represents a very different type of state-society relation. It represents both cooperation between state and society, but even more importantly, contestation of power. Society does not allow the state to have a monopoly. And that made us think of Alice in Wonderland where the Red Queen tells Alex, Al Alice, in this land, it takes all the running you can do just to stay where you are. Well, that's a bit like the state-society relations. Both of them have to run very fast. That's why they are building out additional capacity, but so that they can stay where they are in their relative position. So that's why we call this Red Queen dynamics. Examples, UK and some European, but also some many non-European nations, as we explain in the book, U.S. is a contingent example. It illustrates some of the difficulties for us of being in the corridor and some of the threats of almost heading out of the corridor, as well as some other cases that we discuss in the book. But let me give some more ideas about this figure and how things work before turning to apply them to the modern period. First, these are all choices. Nothing preordains whether you are in the corridor or not, and countries do transition one to the other. And there are certain social calculus calculations that are critical in understanding why creating a Leviathan is difficult, why shackling it is even harder, and why many societies are actually not so successful in doing so. And this was something that is probably, in our reading, even much more ancient than the Gilgamesh epic. Fear of political hierarchy among small-scale societies is endemic. Small-scale societies are in constant fear of what we call the slippery slope. Create political hierarchy, then you end up with a Leviathan, but the Leviathan is Janus-faced. It can first come in order to help you, 
resolve disputes, provide some public services and coordination, but soon it starts bossing people around, putting them to work, enslaving them, killing them, dominating them. And this is exactly why we see a particular set of customs, norms, and organizations in surviving small-scale hunter uh, small-scale societies, stateless societies like the TIV, which are not hunter-gatherers, actually are settled. They do they practice foraging as well as a lot of uh, the settled agriculture. But the TIV are distinguished by lack of political hierarchy, and uh, anthropologists who studied them, staying with them for two decades, such as the husband and wife team, Bohanon and Bohanon, describe their customs and norms as very much targeted against political hierarchy. There is a complete distrust of power, and many of the customs, including the witchcraft, are all organized around bringing down people who are powerful so that that, political hier that, that lack of political hierarchy can be maintained, that egalitarian norms can be maintained. Well, those are not unique to the TIV or to small-scale societies. That sort of suspicion of power, we argue in the book, is common everywhere, unless the despotic Leviathan completely convinces you that those who are currently holding power are su supremely virtuous. But it is visible in one of the birthplaces of democracy, for example, Athens. Athens is actually a great example because not only is it a first uh, specimen of a fairly developed type of democracy, but it shows how state power and democratic participation went hand in hand. As Athenians built better democratic institutions, they also empowered the state, and the Athenian state actually achieved things that are really spellbounding district court judges, orphanage system, reward network, government sanctioned money, uh, various types of redistributive programs and regulation of trade and redistribution. But this was all undergirded by institutions that themselves were very much built on suspicion of power. One of the emblematic laws that Cleisthenes one of the founders of Athenian democracy passed what's called the ostracism law. According to the law, every year the, uh, <clears throat> the assembly would vote whether there will be an ostracism. And if there was an ostracism, every adult male citizen, only male unfortunately, would write on a piece of sh broken shard the name of a person. These shards were called ostracon, hence the name ostracism. And whosoever name was written most would then be ostracized and banished from the city for 10 years. Here you see Themistocles, one of the heroes of the uh, Persian War and one of the people who actually saw and understood the Persian, oh, sorry, uh, the Spartan threat, the threat against Athens was ostracized because people thought he was getting too big for his britches. So this was one of the many tools that Athenians have and institutionalized tools that were for controlling, shackling the Leviathan. So you now get a sense of how much of a work it was, but also how feasible it was to shackle the Leviathan, even when you had many fewer tools and many fewer ways of political participation. <clears throat> and that's the essence of what we call the Red Queen. But it is also important that we say, and we argue, and I believe, and this will play a role in my remaining observations, contested power is greater power. This is in contrast to common views in political science, for example, people like Samuel Huntington, who argue that greater state capacity, better states, capable states come when one group dominates another sort of a avalanche theory of state building. You become powerful, you 
break down all of the barriers, you repress others, and that's how state capacity comes. To us, it's the complete opposite. It is the contestation between citizens, different groups, that brings this red queen dynamics and builds states. And that's actually important to understand. And one way of understanding that is to turn to an important idea in political sociology due to Charles Tilly about where capable states, strong states come from. This is actually one of the ideas that is still probably most influential in political science departments and writing. Charles Tilly argued famously uh, that states were made in Europe and therefore weren't made in other parts of the world such as Latin America or Africa because of war, especially interstate war. Tilly summarized in his statement, <clears throat> states made war and war made the state. There is some truth to that as illustrated by some of the examples that Tilly and his followers provide. But looked at it from our framework, it is also very incomplete, as illustrated by the many counterexamples of critiques of critics of Tilly provide. And here is one way of thinking about it, and this figure will play a role in my concluding comments when I come back to the challenges ahead as well. Take Tilly's favorite change in structural factors, or what political scientists and sociologists call structural factors. Things such as technology, which again is going to be one of our concerns in uh, evaluating today's challenges. Pandemics, that's a structural factor. Demographic changes, such as demographic collapse. And the one that Tilly focuses on as a defining structural factor is the military revolution, increasing role of mass armies, mili new military tools such as cannons and better muskets, better guns, that increase interstate warfare. And he argues the reason why we built stronger states is because that necessitated stronger states, something meant you have to have stronger states in order to be able to survive in this new military world. And that meant states had to build bigger armies, requisition them, raise taxes to finance these armies, rebuild roads, build bureaucracies, and so on. Well, but actually this figure shows that Tilly's story is half right, half wrong. You can have an increase in the power of the state, say brought forth by the military revolution, and it did happen in the Montenegro when they were fighting the Ottomans, Nothing happened. Montenegrins did not develop a state until uh, the Yugoslavian Confederation came. It really worked out the same way, this way, the way that uh, Tilly has envisages, for example, in Switzerland, where the increasing threat from the Holy Roman Empire forced independent Swiss cantons to band together, fall, form federal power, build stronger armies, build stronger laws to uh, to deal with this new confederation and go into a spree to build public services and other aspects of state capacity. But Tilly's favorite example, Prussia, is actually quite different. In Prussia, the military state building we document in the book actually took Prussia out of the corridor. In the Voltaire's world, other countries have, other states have armies in Prussia, the army has a state. It became that militarized, and of course, any tradition of society withstanding states' challenges and contesting power disappeared. So therefore, this figure, as James and I read it, says, structural factors, technology, demographic change, pandemics, they don't force you in any given direction. They change trade-offs, they provide new tools, new challenges, but they are what you make of them. You can make very different things, you can make very different choices, and it depends both on what you do with them and where you are. Montenegrins, of course, had very different choices available to them than Prussians. Prussians could have stayed in the corridor. That's not something Montenegrins could do. So history, where you are in this figure, also matters. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that nothing matters from history. For example, how narrow or how broad the corridor is very important. Inequality is one aspect of that. 
the nature of production, the nature of communication and political discourse, those are aspects that make the corridor narrower or wider. If you have a wide corridor, it's easier to defend democracy and liberty, and it's easier to create them when they are absent. And if you have a narrow corridor, it's more likely, you are more likely to spin out of control. So one thing we have to worry about, and I'll talk about this in my concluding comments, whether technological changes and social changes, including inequality and empowerment of a narrow group of people in the West and in developing nations, has made the corridor narrower than it was in the 1980s or 1990s. So what does this say about the future of liberty? Well, the same conclusions that I developed in some detail in the context of the military revolution and the empowerment of the state, whether it leads to long-run state dynamics or whether it takes you out of the corridor where you end up with a despotic configuration really depends on what you do with them. And the same is true for technology. AI as a broad technological platform doesn't need to be used to empower <coughs> states or monitoring or snooping or facial recognition or as a censoring tool for the Chinese Communist Party. AI can be a tool in the hands of citizens. It can be a tool to pro protect democracy privacy. AI is used in equal part in the technologies that companies such as Palantir develop in order to provide greater repression power to governments, or in tools such as Tor that make it harder for individuals to be seen when they uh, surf the web or do other things. So that's a choice. And I think it's a political choice. The same is true when it comes to the implications of new technologies for inequality or what we do with the pandemic. These are all choices that will depend on what we do with them. But I think AI is actually something important that we have to think about because it's a very ubiquitous technology. It will affect many dimensions of our lives. It has already done so through social media and online platform for democratic discourse, misinformation, what we believe, how we communicate. Perhaps less emphasized, it has also done so for the structure of the economy. It is no surprise that the middle class jobs that I highlighted as disappearing and undergirding the increase in, significant increase in inequality are those that have routine components, manual routine components replaced by robots, non-manual routine components replaced as in clerical occupations by software algorithms and increasingly by AI. But again, my own work, which I don't have time to get into, but happy to answer questions on it in the Q&A session, emphasizes that AI could be used in many different ways, could be used to create new tasks that actually are egalitarian, that empower workers to find new jobs and new opportunities in workplaces. So again, it's a choice, but it's not a choice that we can somehow entrust elites, certainly not tech companies, even when you are in San Diego, certainly not governments. And this is again where the vision difference between Gilgamesh and us, or the Gilgamesh epic and us comes in. If you think that somehow the US constitution or the set of checks and balances that were introduced 250 years or 230 years ago will somehow protect us and make us choose the right options among those choices. Well, that is, I think, wishful thinking. I think we need much greater ways for society to become empowered and be part of that decision. But also, in line with the Red Queen effect, for the state to play more of a role in dealing with some of these challenges as long as it is monitored and shackled by society. But when I call for a greater state, better social safety net, perhaps the state playing some more, not perhaps, definitely the state playing some more of a role in the direction of technology so that AI doesn't spin out of control. Those are greater responsibilities. And whenever you do that, there's an important 
caveat, which was well articulated by one of the most important social scientists of the 20th century in the context of one of the most influential social science books of the 20th century, Hayek's Road to Serfdom. He wrote the book in large part in response to the Beveridge Report in 1942, which was in the middle of the war, a very important turning point for Britain. And it <clears throat> provided <coughs> the blueprint for the subsequent welfare state that was to come. Minimum wages, progressive taxation, aid for families with poor children, health care, social security, and regulations were all articulated in the beverage report. Some of this came already in the 1930s in Scandinavia, especially Sweden, but the beverage report was a true uh, phenomenon for Britain and for the post-war era. Many people were completely inspired. Some have argued that it played an important role in Britain's, ordinary Brits, becoming motivated to fight the war even more vigorously. But Hayek was worried. He thought this would be a new totalitarianism because the state was being empowered. In the same way that some are alarmed today when we give the South Korean state, the Chinese state, the German state additional powers so that they can track and trace where we are and whether we are infected and so on and so forth. Is that a road to serfdom? Hayek's way of thinking about it is actually quite modern and has many echoes of the ideas that we talk about. He wrote, this means, among other things, that even a strong tradition of political liberty is no safeguard if the danger is precisely that new institutions and policies will gradually undermine and destroy that spirit. Well, so Hayek was right to be worried, but at the end, even though we require new responsibilities from the state again, I think Hayek's concerns turned out to be misplaced and can turn out to be misplaced again today. And the reason for that is important to understand. Hayek thought that the only way you can shackle the state in our terminology is to limit its powers. But our framework says, well, there's another way of shackling the state, which is again, exactly what the, uh, <clears throat> what the Swedish civil society worked out after 1932 when the Workers' Party came to power and started uh, a very radical welfare state program. It's the Red Queen effect. Democracy deepens, civil society becomes better at monitoring, it participates in some of the decisions, again, which worked out through the corporatist model of the Swedish uh, Worker Party, but will have other ways, as it, for example, we saw in the UK. And to translate it to today, what it implies is something very difficult, but still feasible. If we want new responsibilities from the state, in many, many different dimensions, we also need to step up ourselves and strengthen democracy. It's not easy, but it's doable. But there has one mantra, balance of power, balance of power, and balance of power. Strengthening of both state and democracy both the power of the state and power of society are impossible if one side or one part of the coalition or one part of the ideological spectrum becomes too dominant versus another. As I said at the beginning, what defines the corridor is both contestation and cooperation, and that's impossible if you have an imbalance of power. That's what perhaps luckily, perhaps fortunately, fortuitously worked out in much of the Western world and some developing nations in the decades that followed World War II. The question is whether we can do it again and whether we can prove Hayek wrong again today. I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ajemoğlu, for this really excellent and insightful presentation that address many questions about COVID, about state society relations. And before the questions, let me emphasize that this event was made possible by the endowed chair of Porteous Political Science Endowment in the College of Arts and Letters at San Diego State University. And this, my name is Ahmed Kuru. I'm the Porteous chair. Uh, 
and I am honored to have our first webinar this year with Professor Ajemolu. We will have a second webinar on April 5th by Francis Fukuyama. And I am happy to see that Professor Ajemol had many references to Francis Fukuyama. So therefore the two webinars will really complement each other. So uh, I would like to start right now. We have many questions. I read and ranked them. And I would like to start my own question because I was very interested in the book, highlighted many pages and had many questions, but I only give myself purgatory for one single question, which is about uh, the comparison and connection between Ajemolu's previous, one of previous books, which is award-winning economic origin of dictatorship and democracy, also quoted by Robinson. And in this new book, Narrow Corridor, there is a very strong engagement with state society literature. And my PhD advisor was Joel Migdal, and Joel Migdal and others contributed, as Narev Corridors refers to them, in 1980s, 90s, and 2000. But in the last decade, this literature was almost forgotten. And I think Narrow Corridor really revived and make them relevant once again. So when I contrast the economic origin of dictatorship and democracy, where Ajemol and Robinson make a case about the relationship and a game between the elite and the masses. And if I, I, I'm not misrepresenting the argument, what I understand is that the masses want to use democratic tools for redistribution of wealth and the elite is concerned about the redistribution and if if we put this argument about elite versus masses game about democracy versus revolution and redistribution of wealth through taxation and other democratic means versus the narrow corridor emphasis about state and society, how balance and, and how the limitation of the two let us a narrow corridor of liberty. My question to you, Daron, whether you see the two argument complementary, whether they address different aspects of democracy and dictatorship, how would you combine them in a unified way? That's my question. And thank you, Ahmed. I'm, thank you. Yeah, I'm planning to have one question, one answer. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank, thank you. Well, uh, a couple of uh, preludes to an answer. First of all, thank you very much for the question. And thank you very much for bringing up my first book, Economic Origins. Uh, James and I have been working for <clears throat> uh, almost 25 years together. Uh, and uh, we have written many, many papers and three books, Economic Origins, Why Nations Fail, and uh, The Narrow Corridor. Uh, but of course, our thinking has evolved over time. And Economic Origins was essentially uh, based on the research we did in the 1990s. And extremely simplified, and I'm not sure how interesting this uh, history of my thoughts is to the audience, but since you asked for the unity among these things, there are really two major ideas in that book. One is exactly what you've mentioned, which is that key is economic redistribution, who taxes, what you do with tax revenues, redistribution. And the second is the key role of collective action, de facto power, threats and protests and so on by non-elites in order to get power and force institutional change. And already when we started working in some of the works in the 2000s and the Why Nations Fail, we sort of abandoned the first one to some extent. That's one aspect, but it's not the most important aspect. But the second one was present in the, the Why Nations Fail and it is present in the more recent book and even more important. So I don't think that taxation is the only or even the main 
area. I think it is one important aspect, but if you go back in history, coercion is very important. If you go uh, to many parts of the world today, what type of public goods, what type of justice, what type of philosophy of governance is going to be important? Who has social status and social power? Those are equally important. So in the narrow corridor, for example, we put a lot of emphasis on dispute resolution. So that's an important part of liberty, but also equality. If in my disputes with you, Ahmed, you're always right, that's not gonna be liberty, that's not gonna be very conducive to many things in the social cohesion domain. So that's why I think taxation is an important thing. And you know, for some of our, in our empirical work, for example, we find that one of the things that democracies do right away, they increase taxes so that they can provide public services, but especially the different types of public services. Dictatorships also provide public services. They provide healthcare, but they don't provide healthcare to the poor. If you want healthcare to the poor, that's more expensive, it's harder, and democracies tend to do that, and they tend to do that by increasing taxes first. So taxes are important, but, but it's, it's, it's embedded in a broader setting. Thank you very much. That, that's a very helpful answer. And now I have a question from Hisham Fuad, Professor of Economics here at San Diego State University. Uh, can the power of the state be balanced by society without democratic institutions? If not, then how can societies without democratic institutions acquire them when opposed by a powerful state with a vested interest against the formation of these institutions? And let me link this question, if I may, to why nations fail, where there is an emphasis on institutions, of course, and also a little bit more critical junctures, pet dependence, and history. In your new book and this presentation, there is a more emphasis on agency. And I personally like it because of the way you explain the rise of the West. Because in my understanding, the Western history is not linear progress. After the Rome, there was a decline. And in my book, for example, I showed that Muslims were superior to Western Europe between 8th and 12th century. Then came the rise of the West. Therefore, we cannot just see the combination of German participatory institutions plus Roman statehood as a continuity in the West, there is more zigzags and rise and fall. So therefore, I'm very happy and to see the emphasis on agency, more contingency rather than a pu pure and smooth pet dependency. So, uh, so to sum up, Professor Hisham Fouad's question, I, my addition is that how do you see institutions and how you see the argument in the way nations face and narrow corridor about democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, I think there are several aspects to this question, to these questions, both Professor Ishad Hassan's and, 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 and yours. You know, first of all, one thing I want to emphasize, two things really, uh, in response to your question. Yes, absolutely, zigzags are very important as we stress in the book, building of institutions liberty in the corridor is a very slow process. The early fusion of Roman institutions and Germanic participatory assemblies and so on, traditions, was very imperfect, was often very violent, had its ups and downs. And second, economics and politics can diverge for long periods of time. This is something uh, we emphasize, for example, with Ibn Khaldun's discussion of how you can have very different uh, dynamics in despotic regimes and sometimes a lot of uh, economic success early on, but, but, but it also has some of the seeds of its own destruction. So I think all of those you have to sort of bear in mind in interpreting some of the dynamics across different parts of the world. And those are also relevant when you come to think of democracy. You know, democracy in its true form is a rather recent phenomenon. We tend to say, oh, you know, Britain started becoming democratic with the first reform act in 1832. Well, the first reform act expanded the franchise 
from less than 2% of the adult population to, you know, to 5% of the adult population. By no means anything approaching democracy. But go further back, you know, there were primitive ways in which society participated in politics, even be that democratic institutions. So thank you for bringing up the Germanic assemblies, for example, Ahmed. So we put some emphasis on those. They were by no means democratic. But going back to the time of Tacitus and Julius Caesar, we know that Germanic tribes had these very strong assemblies. Some of them were only elites participated. Some of them all, uh, citizen is not the right word, but all tribesmen participated. And they had some real powers, but by no means democratic. But those were sufficient under some circumstances in constraining ruler power. However, fast forward to today, it's very difficult for me to see how in the modern day with the great, much greater powers of the state, you can constrain ruler power, politician power, bureaucratic power without some sort of democratic institutions. Norms and traditions won't be enough proto-democratic, you know, or for democratic institutions. For example, as in Turkey, think of the, how powerless the Turkish parliament is, they're not gonna be enough. So you need all methods, including media, including civil society participation, including democratic participation for society to be able to do what Hayek thought it couldn't do, withstand the much greater powers of the state. Thank you so much. So if you let me move the next question, it's directly linked what you just said about Turkey, because there is a question about Turkey and Russia and asking what are your policy recommendations or predictions about the future of the possible democratization in the case of Turkey and or Russia regarding your argument in the book? Well, I think every country is different when you look at its details. So in the narrow corridor, we talk a little bit about Turkey in, uh, <clears throat> in, the, in, in, in the penultimate chapter. And we caricaturize Turkey as a, uh, perennial despotic state that has never truly moved into the corridor. It's always been a problem in Turkey, definitely during the Ottoman time, no doubt about it in my mind, but also during the Republican period for society to really contest power and have its voice heard. It's been fairly top down. And attempts to enter the corridor have not worked out. For example, periods of opening, including in the early 2000s, have been foiled. Why is that? We can get into the details. I don't know whether that would be of interest to the audience or not. But recently, I thought a little bit more about these things <coughs> in the context of writing a foreword to a new Oxford uh, Handbook of Turkish Politics. And when I used a little bit of the framework from Narrow Corridor for Turkey, I characterized Turkey a little differently than in the book. Sure, outside of the corridor, but actually not too far from the corridor. So if you remember China, and I would put Russia in there as well, they have had many centuries of despotic rule that civil society became very weak and the ideal of democracy is not very strong. Sure, you've had periods like the Tiananmen Square, but they have been relatively small and muted affairs and they have been suppressed. So you would be right, I think, in applying this framework to China or Russia to say they are far from the corridor. Turkey, on the other hand, interestingly, 
hasn't for since the beginning of the multi-party rule in the 50s, hasn't abandoned parliament, uh, electoral democracy completely. And civil society has not been completely suppressed. It has had four or five coups, but all of them have been short-lived and have passed the baton back to democratic institutions. Even Erdogan, at the height of his power in one sense, although not really, when he annulled the Istanbul mayoral elections and went for a re-election and he lost that, he couldn't repudiate it again and say, no, no, I'm going to keep control of Istanbul, which was the real prize for a rent-seeking economy. And it to say, you know, okay, fine, I lost the election, I'll fight another time. So I think in terms of the framework, there are a variety of reasons that Turkey is not moving too far away from the corridor, which means that in the future, it's going to be very difficult. Turkish institutions have been battered over the last two decades, or 15 years at least. But there is some hope of if the right sort of institutional building, especially for media and judiciary, can take place, Turkey might have another chance to move into the corridor. Thank you very much. And there is a question <laughs> about the United States. Sorry? And whether in the, uh, there is a question about here in, in, in the United States and with right-wing populism and as the recent Capitol Hill attack, uh, are, can we talk about the weakening of the state and the rise of uh, some non-democratic popular movements and aspects of society in yes. America? Yes, we can, absolutely. And that's not, you know, actually that unusual. I certainly don't think by any stretch of imagination that there are close parallels between Trump and his followers and interwar Nazism or fascism. But still, we can learn about some of the social forces and objectives of current right-wing uh, uh, populism from the interwar era. And both Italian fascists and which we don't discuss in the book, but and German Nazis, which we do discuss in the book, simultaneously increase the despotic power of the state in some dimensions, such as repression, the jackboots, and the Gestapo, but also weaken many aspects of the regulatory and judicial power of the state. And I think that's even more pronounced when you look at the history of right-wing movements in the United States. And for reasons that perhaps are somewhat related, federal bureaucratic regulatory power have always been anti the role of the Southern elites and pro-protecting minorities or poorer segments of society to some degree. And that's why in many periods, the, especially the populist right-wing movements have sought to weaken parts of the power of the state. I don't think that explains the Capitol Hill attack, of course, but it explains why the after four years of Trump, the federal government is actually weaker today, and it is a process of rebuilding that, that we will need to go through. Thank you very much. Uh, we are asking too many questions, but I am trying to filter. There is a one question by Professor Lei Guang, political science professor, uh, about the hierarchical forces within society, from family to religious institutions and communities, to different neighborhoods pressures. If society itself is very authoritarian without the need of state authoritarianism, then, then how can we achieve a democratization with such a society, even if it's able to balance the power of state. And, and then what about mafia and amoral familyism and many hierarchical social forces and authoritarianism deep in society itself? That's the question. 
those are great questions. I don't have full answers to them. But one aspect of that we discuss in some length in the book. And another aspect is what James and I are working on right now. But let me just, for brevity's sake, focus on what we discuss in the book, uh, uh, which is what we call the cage of norms. That norms are a powerful weapon in state society struggle, but they're also can be also some of the real enemies of liberty because norms often enshrine very restrictive practices and very incipient hierarchies that are hard to reverse. If you look at many small scale societies, they have very tight norms and those tight norms create slave-like conditions for many, including women. Some of it is enshrined in customs. Some of it are practices that are tolerated. But what we describe in the book is a very unhappy existence between states and norms. The cage of norms often becomes a straight jacket for states. And unless they can reshape them, they will ultimately start breaking them. But in some conditions, they can reshape them. The example that we give in the book is the Chinese state that has turned lineages into a method of control. But in most cases, including in Latin America or South America and medieval Europe, the cage of norms starts becoming less tenable when state building and greater involvement of the state in economy and social relations and dispute resolution gets started. But there's much more to be said in response to this question, but I, I let me not do that because that will go yet even in a different direction and towards our current work on how to conceptualize culture and interpret them and in, 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 integrate them into some of this analysis. Then we, we look forward to your, your new publications then and <laughs> new projects. So the next question by another professor of political science, Mikhail Alexeyev, and he asked, what do you believe would be the biggest strategic surprise, a game changer in the world politics five to 10 years from now on, and especially after the pandemic we are facing today? Well, that's a great question. And I'm not an expert, but before I give you the answer to that, I have actually just run out of water. If you can sure, give me course. 30 seconds, I'm going to go course, and get a, get a cup of water Definitely. and then I'll be back in one second and I'll answer that question. Of course. And meanwhile, let me repeat to everyone that on April 5th, we are going to have another uh, important scholar with a big questions, Francis Fukuyama. He will talk about the challenges liberalism is facing today. And we'll hopefully see you in our next webinar in about less than 40 days. And while waiting, let me tell you that we have another 15 minutes. You can still send us your questions. I'm reading them all, but if I am unable to recite your question, ask it because we have about 30 more questions. Please forgive me. It's not for being disrespectful because it's because of the time constraint. And we already made Professor Ajimola tired and we can keep asking more and more questions. I think I'll have three more questions, then we'll wrap up. Sorry about that. No, uh, no, thank you. We make you very tired. Thank you for uh, no, 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 all of your fine. Quest answers. So next question uh, by- oh, No, no, I'll, I'll answer, oh, I'll yeah, answer yeah, the question. Of yes, course. Yes, sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, I didn't want to duck out of that. It's a, of it's a difficult question. And, and at some level, my answer is not going to be very surprising. I think China. 
but in a way that is in some sense also self-reflective uh, of the way in which Jim and I have thought about China. So uh, <clears throat> we thought of China going back to why nations fail as not an atypical case, meaning that the despotism of China had many parallels, both especially in East Asia, but in other parts of the world. The uh, Chinese economic growth came from economic institutions that have led to growth in other places. And much of the Chinese growth of the 1990s and 2000s was in the form of despotic or extractive growth as we described in both books. But there are ways in which China has been very successful and is charting a new course that I think need to be taken into account both in international relations. I think there's very little doubt that the Chinese uh, system, let's call it that way, mm -hmm. did better than many people expected, both in the aftermath of the global financial crisis and in the context of the pandemic. And the future might see yet even more emboldening developments in China, which I think will have potentially far-reaching consequences for the international order and, and other things, especially in light of the fact that China is becoming more active as a supporter of non-Western, non-democratic nations or governments around the world. And I think the wild card here is data, AI, and government control. So when we said in Why Nations Fail, and to some degree in the narrow corridor, that the Chinese system, even though it's very durable and it's going to be very successful in certain things as a despotic leviathan can, it has a weakness, which is innovation, experimentation, technological change. Well, today, there is a potential wild card in that, which is the Chinese state has massive amounts of data, much more than any other country, and is pouring unparalleled amount of resources in AI. So can this combination of great data without any privacy concerns, social credit system, facial recognition, much better, tighter control with lots of data, which was very important for the Chinese response to the pandemic, actually be an alternative model of innovation, technological change, and then exported around the world? I think that's the question. And that's going to be the wild card for both international and domestic affairs. Thank you. Thank you very much. So questions are still coming, but I want to end with two last questions. One is more theoretical, the other is more practical about Iran. The first uh, the theoretical one by a professor of political theory, Farid Abdul Noor, and here is this his question. Much of the focus is on being within or outside the corridor. And my question is about looking inside the corridor and Petit's understanding of liberties, non-domination that you mentioned at the very beginning. How does the no domination that takes place within the corridor fit into the framework where the state can protect the right of some to dominate others, especially in terms of economic relations? Great question. And very, very, very important. And this is why the hardest chapter to write in the book, I can tell you, was the U.S. chapter, and I signaled out U.S. when I showed the corridor, that for us, U.S. is a test case of the difficulties of the corridor. But it's actually something we anticipate also when we look at Europe. So as Ahmed also mentioned, you know, our rendition of the history is that Europe entered the corridor shortly after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire because of the interplay between the Germanic bottom-up institutions and customs and uh, vestiges of the blueprints of centralized bureaucratic state from the Roman Empire. But look at what 
Europe looked like in the 9th centuries or the 10th centuries or even the 11th centuries, 12th centuries, 13th centuries. Well, people were right. There was a reason. I mean, that's now uh, disputed as a terminology, but historians were not completely off base when they called these the Dark Ages. These were not, you know, enlightened times. There was a lot of repression. There was a lot of lack of freedom. So it was a process. There were many dominations of, of very different sorts inside the corridor. And when you look at recent and not so recent American history, and that's why it's so difficult, you see that being in the corridor has gone hand in hand with subjugation of one fifth, one sixth of the population, the blacks as slaves, then their fairly systematic exploitation after the collapse of reconstruction under Jim Crow and even after Jim Crow. It has also coexisted with very unusually high level of poverty in the United States, precisely because of the way in which US federal state institutions were formed. But that to us shows some of the nuances of the theory. Why is that? Well, at the time, the only way perhaps, I don't know, but certainly the most direct way for US to enter at the time by, I mean, at the, at the beginning of the, uh, uh, of independence was with a compromise with Southern elites. And that compromise involved several key elements. One was, of course, slavery. So entering the corridor meant directly the subjugation of <clears throat> perhaps a fifth of the population. Second, it involved guarantees to the Southern elites, as well as to some other people who were afraid of federal state power, lots of constraints on state power. And federal state power was so hemmed in in the United States that many things that came natural to European states, the federal state in the United States couldn't do at all. And one fallout from that was poverty reduction. So building social safety nets, protecting citizens, especially disadvantaged citizens, that became much harder for the federal state. So in that sense, the question is exactly on target. The development travel in the corridor has created opportunities, greater freedoms for some people, while at the same time subjugating and dominating others. On the other hand, the story is not just one of the bad aspects of American institutions. The civil rights movement, movement also shows that once those tools of political participation are there, the subjugated groups can also use them. And civil rights is an amazing victory, precisely because it took place largely peacefully within the corridor using exactly the tools that had developed in the corridor. Was it an unmitigated success? No, we are still trying to continue some of that tradition. But it shows that those tools can be used. But when you look at success in terms of economic insecurity, that very important being subject to the arbitrary will of employers or other forces because you are so poor and you have such a marginal existence in the economy, those still continue in the US economy. Thank you very much. And, and the last question is about Iran and the Arab world. As you know, this is the 10th anniversary of the so-called Arab Spring, at least the Egyptian revolution. We just passed a few months ago. 
And when we look at the last 10 years experience in the Middle East and the efforts to democratize almost failed except in Tunisia. And when we look at the future of the Middle East, Arab countries and Iran, which social di dimensions and state dimensions can make us hopeful or pessimistic about the future of democratization in the Middle East? Well, I think, of course, the Middle East is one of the hardest areas to study for many reasons. For me, you know, I am not, I am very, very far from being an expert. I know a little bit about the Arabic world, both in the North Africa and, uh, and the Middle East. Uh, unfortunately, I am very ignorant of the Iranian context. In fact, uh, I've had this question of why Iran does not feature in our book, in our books at all, because it's such a great case from so many Iranian uh, journalist, scholar, students, and my answer is, unfortunately, we just don't know enough about Iran, and we never had the time to find out. So I'm not going to be able to say anything about Iran, although it's a super interesting case. I think for the rest of the Middle Eastern scene, the situation is, of course, not very appetizing. But I think there are a couple of things to note. I think the equilibrium that the Middle East was in for much of the second half of the 20th century was untenable. It was going to collapse at some point. I think both Iraq and Libya, in my mind, and you can say Syria, uh, are emblematic of that. You had a very despotic state, but also very weak because very dependent on tribal and the other divisions that were just manipulated the right way. And as we try to discuss in some detail in the chapter 12 of the narrow corridor, the tradition of Islam, especially used by, as it came to be used by uh, <clears throat> despotic states in the Middle East, had also greatly complicated Middle Eastern politics essentially as a very flexible and powerful tool in the hands of despots, but also closing many avenues of civil society participation, except when they went through Islamic channels. And I think, again, that created many, many difficulties. And it's not a surprise, I think, in hindsight, but even at the time you could have said that, you know, the Arab Spring was gonna fail in Syria, in Libya, in uh, <clears throat> certainly in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and so on. Whether it had to fail in Egypt, I think that's, that's a more contested question. But I also think that many of these regimes are actually much weaker than first meets the eye, because the traditional methods of control are not going to work out but what, of course, worries me is that when that control weakens, I think it's going to be very difficult to uh, avoid a lengthy period of war, civil war, mayhem, just like what we witnessed in Syria and Iraq or still witnessing in, uh, in Libya. So I think there are great challenges ahead of, uh, of, of, of the Middle East. And I don't think there are any easy solutions to any of this, but I think one way of moving forward is to find a new way of, cust uh, a, a new way of discourse that is consistent with the customs and norms, but is not so beholden to Islamic 
confines of debate and what it is to be, you know, uh, sufficiently Islamic, Islamically virtuous in order to be able to have a say in the public discourse. That's not an easy thing, and it's become much harder for to do in Turkey, for example, but I think it is feasible. And again, Tunisia is an example of what, what that makes feasible in some sense. Well, many thanks. We all appreciate your insightful and very thought-provoking presentation and answers. And thanks for your time. And I also appreciate the audience. Many people join from Indonesia, India, Turkey, and elsewhere, and listen carefully the Q and A session as well. I am also thankful to SDSU faculty and staff, especially Jessica Baham, for making this possible. Any last words, Professor Ajamalu? Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Have a good day. Keep thank safe you, and healthy. Thank, thank you. you. And thanks to, to everyone. Everybody. And thanks this will everybody. be available. Thank you. It is recorded and be available on YouTube. And I'm sure it will be shared in social media and other people will be able to watch it. Thank you. Have a good day.